it's my great pleasure to introduce Lars Williams and Mark uh, Hermansen. They will uh, tell us about how to separate the edible from the inedible. I think that should be an easy thing to do, but they're going to tell us uh, about in a more professional way. Lars uh, Williams is head of research and development at the Nordic Food Lab, where Mark Hermansen also is a member. Uh, together, they have um, founded the restaurant uh, Numa, uh, which is listed in um, uh, the Michelin Guide with two stars. Now we are also, well, this is basically applied chemistry, I believe. Uh, now we are going to do an experiment um, here also. I'm a little bit nervous about this because you are not allowed to eat food in this room, uh, which is now being <laughs> circulated around here. Uh, please don't mess up too much. With these introductory remarks, uh, Lars Williams and Mark Hermansen, floor is yours. We look forward to this very much. It's a question that Mark and I, as we work with a lot of different projects, have really tried to wrap our heads around. Um, a lot of the projects, a lot of the products that Noma uses uh, are typically thought as odd. For Scandinavians, um, something like seaweed isn't part of their daily sort of consumption, yet there's the biodiversity of seaweed in Scandinavia is equal to that of Japan. So when we look at a product like seaweed and we see that it has such importance to other cultures, it provides us with a great impetus and um, to really try and find a way that we can use this great natural resource in the cuisine. Um, so that's a picture of what you just had. The Nordic Free Lab was started four years ago by Rene Rizepi and Klaus Myers. The reason that Rene found a need for something like a research platform for food was because of horseradish. He was getting in a, he had a dish on the menu that was very, had a lot of horseradish. They were processing a lot of horseradish. And uh, he noticed that it often tasted different from day to day. And so he got uh, irritable with some of his chefs. And they said, no, we're doing the same recipe. We're doing following the recipe exactly, same process. And he started tasting the horseradish as it came in. And he noticed that it tasted very, very different day to day from the same farmers. So he goes to his farmers and asks what's going on. And they said, well, we don't know. They all look a little bit different, but it's from the same field. As far as we know, it's the same plant. So he finally went to an institution called the Nordic Gene Bank. And they said, oh, yeah, of course. There's group of plants that all have the same scientific name, but there's actually 146 varieties. And it's the same scientific name, just a little number on the end of it that delineates it. And you have all the fields, in Denmark at least, is more or less a mix of all these different varieties of horseradish. Some are very peppery, some are sweet, some taste like parsnip. And when Rene sort of discovered this huge complexity in a product that he thought at one time was so simple, it, became, it was like sort of entering the rabbit's hole, as it were, that there needed to be more research done to educate people, but also to educate chefs in terms of the complexity of the different things they were dealing with. Um, this is me, a little less than a year ago, graduating from Oxford University with my degree in social anthropology and a thesis called an anthropological perspective on new Nordic cuisine as an expression of Nordic identity. And uh, as I was standing here drinking champagne in the streets of Oxford, all these girls behind me start, got this idea. I was thinking, why is it that I don't take this piece of work? It's just going to pretty much go to the bin. No one's ever going to read it. I'm going to send it to Rene Sebi, restaurant Noma. He might chip in a free dinner. <laughs> that never happened. What happened instead was that I ended up here. This is me uh, in an, a cold November day in the Copenhagen Harbor using a sauce net to uh, fish for seaweed hoppers. Uh, that were hibernating in the seaweed. Um, because what Rene did instead of a dinner, um, he posed me with a challenge. And the challenge was uh, the question, why is it that I can't eat anything I find on my way? Um, what does it mean that I can't eat these different things? And I said, well, the truth is you can really eat anything. There's only some things are edible, but with a consequence. And those consequences might be physical, and more importantly, they might be um, for this thing at least, uh, social. Um, 
So I think when, 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 when kids are born, they know that they, they try out, they explore the world through what they put in, put in their mouth, and slowly they, they put on this learned behavior of, how they, um, of how, they, how they understand themselves and the world around them, and they get all these uh, kind of cultural and social rules applied to them where they, they, they slowly and gradually learn uh, which things are edible and which are not. Um, but what Rene rather wanted me to do was to, 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 to go on and develop some intellectual tools for the kitchen of some description uh, that we could then go out and, and use as a hypothesis to, to explore further. So, as you all know, here right before lunch, eating is very much a biological act. Uh, it's something we need to do, but, but to paraphrase the great anthropologist Claude Fischler, it's so much more than that. Uh, Food is, um, food is something that, that crosses between the inside and the outside of the body. It's one of the only things in, the, in our lives. Um, and, 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 and this principle of incorporation touches upon the very nature of who we are as people. Um, it, um, it, um, it, it tells us about something about who we are, who other people are, who can we trust, who can we not trust. It's similar cuisines and different cuisines and these things. Um, and it seems evident that as soon as something, like some, some um, ingredient or some taste or something, as soon as there's a, a web of meaning around certain things, uh, it becomes meaningful to also incorporate them in cuisine because the fact is, as, as Lars just described with the, with the ice cream, oh, sorry, with the, with the seaweed, um, a lot of inedible things are, uh, a lot of edible things are actually uh, not eaten. Um, so... Food allows us to imagine who we are, and it gives us a place in, in, in the world. Um, that's the reason why people take bull's testicles like this in Colorado and deep fry them and call them Rocky Mountain oysters because it tells them something about who they are. It tells them uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's like this cultural concept of what is and what is not delicious. Um, and these rules of deliciousness that varies across cultures um, is, a, is, a varying, is a varying concept. So... When you look at these, this, this concept of deliciousness, it, it varies greatly across cultures. Um, even 100 years ago, lobster and these things were not considered edible at all, at least in the Western Hemisphere. Um, only recently, seaweed and, and wild plants even uh, is accepted at, at the, in the Scandinavian palates. And, and in Denmark, you can, even, or some places in Copenhagen, you can buy wild plants in the supermarket as organic white plant, wild plants. Um, um, so it's only when something becomes meaningful to eat, so when, when, when it's, if the, it changes that it becomes meaningful to eat, that, uh, that it gets incorporated in, uh, in cuisine. This works both on a personal and a cultural timescale, and, it, and it, it, it varies greatly throughout our lives and throughout centuries as well. Um, food is the, one of the most lasting cultural stamps on a person, like Lars, who is actually also a um, what? Second generation. Second generation in your region. Um, it's the first time to Norway. Uh, but he still has celebrated a traditional Norwegian Christmas dinner every year in Manhattan since he was born. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that, uh, that, uh, that does this. There's a, you know, there's a reason why people have all these different things. It stays with them for, for a very long time. Um, so when we go out into this, uh, exploring this Nordic cuisine that, that we are working with at, uh, at Nordic Food Lab, it's very much an introspective inquiry because a lot of these new substances, um, we want to, 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 to record a sense of meaning in what we do with these new substances. It needs to remind us of something important. And, 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 and what we do is simply to try and look around us what is, what is close to us and we, ex we explore that through our, through our fantasy and our palettes and, and try to imagine uh, what it means. Um, uh, this is actually Roddy Sloan. We just want to include this guy because he's, uh, he's a supplier for restaurant Noma. Uh, he fishes for, or rather dives, for Arctic sea urchins on the northern coast of Norway. Um, who would imagine that you could ever find sea urchins on the, no in the Arctic Ocean? So it's one of these things that we find often in our research is that once you start peeling the onion, all these fantastic things appear. Um, so we had an epiphany uh, last year, which was when uh, a South American chef, Alex Atala, from the restaurant Dome in uh, in Sao Paulo, he brought this uh, this uh, this uh, was it brine or like a yeah he, <coughs> yeah he came up to us and there was this this pot bright yellow liquid looked like a uh, antifreeze and uh, he goes taste this and I go look in the pot and there's ants just floating on top of the liquid and I go uh, you know Alex it's very funny I'm not gonna eat that and he goes no no taste one and put it in my mouth and it was like a world opening up had these lemongrass flavors, but in a complex and deep way that was like nothing else I'd ever tasted in my life. 
And so we started looking at our landscape and saying, can we find these flavors here? Is this a possibility that's something we had? I think what, it, what, it, what really happened as well was that, well, actually what happened uh, through that was that it, it got us thinking that something could in fact be delicious without first being edible. It was like deliciousness was something, it was like edibility was somehow a concept prior to deliciousness. And, and it appeared to us that if we, if we simply just do the mental trick of turning them around, this deliciousness itself can be separated and just become a driving force of edibility itself. Um, and it becomes kind of an, an agent to apply when you want to explore new and delicious flavors. Uh, so, so, so our idea was, I mean, the, the idea right now is not to, to go on, oh, sorry, I forgot these things. <laughs> uh, this is just a, a, a short selection of these things. I, what I want to say is that I could go on debating these different concepts. What, what we did instead was to, to uh, go into the kitchen with our hypothesis, uh, Lars and I, which is the delineation between edible and inedible is deliciousness itself. So if something is delicious, it's, a, it's edible. Um, I just want you to, to, uh, to, uh, to quickly take up in terms of uh, looking, at, looking at memory and the, the experience of the Nordic landscape and how we try to incorporate that inedible substances into cuisine, not only as an ingredient. Please take up the small vial that's similar to the one you just had um, with the green liquid in it. And, and what this is, is uh, it's, a, it's a vinegar made from a tea of pine. Uh, and it's been blitzed some fresh pine needles into it. Mm -hmm. We did that last night. Um, so it's very fresh. It's, uh, uh, and I'm sure you can, you can recognize some of these things that you usually smell or, or smell from your hands when you touch a tree or something. You can actually incorporate those things and incorporate those memories and that experience of the Nordic landscape. Um, so yeah, we went into the kitchen and, and tried to explore this and, and, and see if it was true, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> so we have a really amazing little graph, <laughs> uh, sort of depicting the way that we approach a lot of research. Um, Mark touched briefly on tradition. Um, that's something that we look forward, we look into quite a bit. Uh, that's one of our main inspirations are these sort of um, sustenance type of preservation that we use in the Nordic area. So that's salting, pickling, smoking. Um, a lot of these techniques that people used to use just to preserve food for the hard winters we have, um, we find can add a lot of flavor. And it's a way of making a new tradition for ourselves. In Denmark, um, with the industrial, sort of with the industrial age, a lot of the old traditions were lost. And at this point, we're now struggling to really find new traditions and find ways of, through food, expressing who we are. Um, I think that you know all traditions were innovations at one time, and if you're not trying to innovate with traditions, then they become stale and sort of um, stagnant, not reflective of where we are at the moment and who we are at the moment. And if we look to, um, I think, if we're having, if you think of sort of trends in food as cyclical, and we're going back to this sort of like very yeah, I, Stone Age way of eating. And then we want to look forward into the future, into what could be the post, the neo-industrial way of eating, where we now have traditions that will be linked probably much more to the individual and smaller communities of people that are trying to create these new traditions. I think what we, yeah, what we found, and we discussed this just yesterday with, with some chefs from, from New York, from the, from the Momofuku lab, um, was how tradition could in fact be maintained through innovation. It's only through that that you can kind of recirculate tradition and kind of keep on inventing that to somehow, I mean, which is happening right now, especially in Denmark with, with, with Nordic cuisine, is that you are, you are you're, you know, very much turning uh, around the circle and going from this, this highly industrialized food system into a to much more localized, um, almost pastoral way of, of, of consuming. So it's production and consumption that together creates this, this, um, this, this, this new way of looking at things, which is really just a reflection or a reinvention of, of previous ways. It's almost, I think the, the analogy we had yesterday is almost like the old tradition, the old, the old person, uh, you know, seeing a shrink uh, who tells him, who allows himself to, uh, to, to kind of look back on, on, his, on his earlier life and, and, uh, and understand some of the things that, you know, maybe went wrong or some things that made, had to be changed. And then they can kind of work with that through life. And, 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 and through that, you kind of recirculate some of those old ideas and, and release some new and old information at all. So it's all kind of this, this flux between old and new ideas that, that really maintain these traditions. Um, yeah. yeah. <coughs> oh, that was the... Uh, so again, as the 
the sort of pine vinegar that you just tasted was a reflection of what sort of the forest would be. Um, you can taste in this guy. Here's um, some of our, what we call sul. It's dulce in English. And this is an aged seaweed that we use in quite a few different products. Um, it's two years old? Yeah, yeah. Two, it's aged for two years. So that white sort of like salt is actually, the glutamic salts coming to the surface of the seaweed as part of the aging process. But this is something that we really try and show people because at least in Denmark, there's a very negative impression of seaweed. People think of it as the sort of rotting mats that you see on the beach that sell sort of sulfurous where we try and show this product to people and saying that there's a lot of possibilities. We actually make an ice cream out of it. It's very sweet, floral. Um, but it, the analogy that we use for this product is that if you were to, to go to an apple orchard and to sort of only look at the rotting apples on the ground, you wouldn't think of it as a very quality product. But if you go and you find a very beautiful, fresh product in the nature, and you take care of it, and you treat it with care, both in harvesting, but also later on in processing it, there's a, a countless possibilities that you can do with it. And uh, that's a, a sort of an ideology and a technique that we apply to uh, most of our interactions with our products. Um, getting to the, the more odd and possibly inedible, this is a kombucha mother. It's something that we started playing around with as uh, one of our preliminary explorations into microbiology. Um, we don't, this doesn't really taste that good by itself, but it's, a, it's very similar to a vinegar mother, except that it processes, it's a symbiotic, this thing is actually called a SCOBY, which stands for, it's a great, uh, Americans are very fond of acronyms, so it stands for Symbiotic Construct of Bacteria and Yeast. And so it's can, <clears throat> continually processing sugars into alcohol and then alcohol immediately into vinegar, um, which is wonderful because it allows us to do things like take a fresh carrot juice that is naturally quite high in sugars, put this kombucha mother in, and then we get a, a brand new product, uh, sort of a carrot kombucha that has, through these dual fermentation processes, much more layers of complexity than you would possibly get in any other way. As the, this is, the microbiology is something that we're quite interested in. Because uh, yeah, I, th I mean, uh, what, what Lars touched upon here as well is, 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 as soon as we started looking at, at some of these really simple ingredients, uh, what we are really uh, starting to do is not only discover, but also to create a sense of terroir in the same way that you have that in, in, in France and Italy, those places, something where, where ingredients are, are closely bound up with the landscape. So what we are really working with now is this, uh, what we have decided to call microbial terroir. Mm -hmm. is looking at, at autochthonous or indigenous microorganisms that can then go in and help us uh, ferment different, different things. So like a kombucha mother is something that, is, that we have been imported for Asia, from Asia, but then we apply it in a, in a, in a Nordic context with the, with the, with the uh, plants and vegetables and juices and things that are in, you know, indigenous to, to that area and, and try and see what we get out of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so furthering that, we started working with... Um, sort of a, a Nordic a fermentation process like miso. Um, this goes back to, this touches on how we sort of process, we try and generate innovation at the Nordic Food Lab by taking an inspiration from another culture and trying to apply some of the techniques. Um, it's a little bit, we feel that it's a little bit different than sort of fusion cooking in the idea that you're taking something that has a, a very distinct identity in another place and just using that product itself, where here we're taking um, the conception of an idea that has, that creates identity, and then using that process to create a new identity in our locale. So this is a, but <laughs> since we're just cooks, we often have to consult with uh, scientists, and this is a, a flavor scientist trying to explain to me for the first time how miso is made. And uh, this was actually on a napkin at a restaurant. <laughs> um, yeah, but so then a lot of these processes are quite simple. This is uh, aspergillus mold growing on rice. When this is, a, again, this uh, scientist Rachel from Harvard University was work, we've been working with her both in terms of uh, making sure we're not dealing with uh, mycotoxins, but also just to sort of have a better sense of what, what the food is what we're doing. <clears throat> so when you have a diet, when you have a movie like this, it's quite easy to show another chef, this is too far. 
<laughs> you want the middle stage where it's just just before it's going to spoilate. But having these sort of collaborations with scientists allows us to have a much deeper understanding, obviously, of what we're doing, but um, also get, we get a lot of inspiration from them. And I think we have a really good back and forth at this moment. We work with uh, Copenhagen University, Southern University. We now have... Uh, Wageningen University. I oh, know a bunch of different universities mm. where we basically just try and create a, a sphere of interdisciplinary cooking where we can draw in every expert from every field and 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 um, and I think it, increasingly that's where chefs find themselves today is, is very much in this intersection between between uh, between science and also you know changing changing demands of the market and they can actually go in and, and, and look at some of the new demands for, for for local foods but also sustainable foods all these things that you can actually bring things forward. Um, just moving on to the, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, but so then, again, bridging this sort of, this gap between edible and inedible, a lot of these sort of fermented things, like rice with mold on it, is something that you wouldn't really consider delicious not, as its own, or I think most of the things that we think of as molded are the unpleasant things in the back of the refrigerator where this is actually um, barley that I've allowed to grow mold on via the aspergillus. And so it actually, so the, until the mycelium binds it into a, a solid cake. And then we just toasted it quite quickly, as a, treating it as it were a piece of meat. Um, and it had these crazy, uh, very, very interesting um, umami properties, uh, almost like Iberico ham with a touch of sweetness. Um, but here in this uh, little capsule, we actually have uh, a miso type product that's made with uh, barley and yellow peas. So in this way, we've applied a, a technique um, that we were sort of again inspired from another country and are using exclusively Nordic products for it. So this is, uh, again, when we're working with scientists, this is the type of things we're, we work with. Whereas <coughs> prior, to, prior to this, we're using exclusively, um, this is, sorry, this is a sort of a map of uh, metabolic pathways of different uh, microorganisms. And so where we take a product that, like asparagus orze, which has very um, sort of Eastern origins, we can now look for uh, microorganisms that have similar metabolic pathways that are going to be able to sort of create the same kind of enzymes that we're looking for to process our food. And so now we're basically looking to create uh, a mic microbial terroir, which I think is a, a really interesting way of having identity in food where we can have a, pro like a food product that can only be created in the area where it's being made. Um, you're taking like a very beautiful natural product, a microorganism that lives in, in one place, and then you create a, a unique product. Um, in the same way that uh, like a sourdough, um, sourdough culture has an identity. If you take a sourdough from San Francisco and you bring it to New York, over the course of a couple of weeks, it'll taste completely different. <laughs> um, when I was, a long time ago, when I was in culinary school, I was obsessed with uh, b baking bread. And so I would come after school, I'd go to work, and then after work, I'd come home and mix my sourdough starter every night. And uh, I had a couple different ones, but one I sort of called the D-train sourdough because uh, the, that train was so grimy at the time. And I had this wonderful, wonderful bread that I was making because I was mixing it every time I came after home after work. And I was quite sure that there were some of these microorganisms from the train somehow getting into my bread. but. Um, having this idea of working in concert with a living organism to um, process food, I think is a, a really beautiful thing. Um, and it was also like a, a very big step for us uh, sort of mentally to think about microorganisms as tools rather than specific to something like a sourdough. To take something like a yeast and apply it to different, different uh, sort of products and think <clears throat> so that we can think about microorganisms as a frying pan or an oven or a Paco jet, that you're sort of dealing with this very complex living machine that you can 
sort of take out of its normal context and process novel foods with it to create a new kinds of traditions. Um, but there's a bright red vial that you can taste. Um, this is, uh, again, it's a lacto-fermented red currant. And here we're again taking uh, sort of a fermentation process that's not normally used on something like berries and creating, I think, a very interesting and novel flavor with it. Um, again, it's, this is inspired in part by tradition, like when uh, sauerkrauts or lacto-ferments were used for preserving foods over long winters. And here we're sort of focusing on flavor. Um, yeah, one of our newest projects is with uh, actually a, 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 a yeast company in, uh, in, some, no, in San Diego, where we're going to try and explore all of these microorganisms and simply put them different places, like you said, on the D train. <laughs> Uh, you know, can we put them under a, an apple tree on top of a roof? Where do we get all these different um, microbial um, cultures and what's the difference between them and most importantly, explore the flavors that's going on and then, and then plant those and see how they work in the birds. So it's just a completely new world that's opened up. Um, and then again, one, one other way of, um, and that's just one way of looking at this um, deliciousness as the driving force of edibility. Another thing we've done uh, most recently is, is, is to start looking to insects. Um, because naturally, when Alex Atala uh, provoked us to, to, to think about this, we thought, you know, why don't we start doing this? Why is it we don't eat insects? Um, I mean, one of the first things we did was to, uh, to just look, yeah, that's why, uh, was to look to movies and to, just to culture. What, how is it, we, uh, how is it, we, uh, how is it we, we see insects? And it, we found out this is pretty much how we see insects. This is the, one of Lars's favorite films, Star Trek, Starship Troopers from 1999, seven or something, I believe. Just giant insects running, taking over the planet, sucking your brains out with a, you know, it's terrible. So, so we, started, we started looking at insects and, 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 um, and all of a sudden we, we, uh, we got all these, you know, we were posting a few pictures on Twitter. Um, people started going crazy over this. We started looking, you know, just saying, you know, this is the, you know, sustainable food of the future, has nine times higher, you know, uh, protein ratio than, no, feed to food ratio than, uh, than, uh, than traditional cattle and meat. Uh, you know, it's the perfect sustainable food. It's the new Hollywood. It's all these different things. And, 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 but as we looked to it, um, there was just no culinary use of it. Just no one knew anything about it. Even the entomologists we consulted never, never occurred to them to try and taste some of them. Um, no one knew what they taste like. And one entomologist even said that if we want people to eat more insects, maybe we should just start serving Cambodian food to everyone. Um, obviously, that's what, what, not what we want to do. What we want to do is to, 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 uh, to take the insects in and try and, try and look at them in a, in, a, in a serious way to see how can we build up a culinary um, identity uh, around these things. Um, um, this that, this yeah. actually, this photo is um, when we went down to speak to the excellent entomologist at Wagenen. They were very polite and took us out for a lunch where the to the culinary school, actually, and the guys were like excited to sort of cook for us, and they made this dish, which was uh, just fish with a couple of grasshoppers on top. And while we were very happy to sort of, you know, uh, be talking to these gentlemen, this is, I think, the opposite of the way that we try and approach integrating insects into our culinary world. This is uh, novelty for the sake of novelty, and for us, if there's not a purpose uh, or it's not delicious, we're really not interested in it. Mm. Um, so we're really trying to find ways of integrating insects into um, our traditions and create new traditions in a way that you're using the insects as like a delicious ingredient as opposed as a kind of joke. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, 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 and why, does it, why is it that you can't use this deliciousness as the primary reason to, to, to explore something rather than, than having to adhere to, to cultural um, conceptions or perceptions of, of how things uh, should work. So, um, so, so most importantly, this is this is where the chefs come in. The, these are the people that can go in and, and, and build up the col culinary uh, taxonomies on insects. Um, and one quote we came around is like, "Do they look worse than turtles? It's only prejudice that can make them taste bad." And that's when I tell you, I don't, you didn't tell them. No. Uh, you know, this garum you had. The first thing you tried was our new fish sauce, a garum, a Roman garum. But it's instead of fish, we used uh, grasshoppers that we fermented with the, with the aspergillus also. So, yeah. 
in this, this way, we're sort of, uh, this is like a, I think, an, a great example of how we approach problems by taking something that you wouldn't normally put in your mouth, like a grasshopper, and processing it in a way that makes it delicious and makes it a condiment and gives us a, an application. Uh, we were inspired by like, a very traditional Western garum. We um, consulted with a bunch of different scientists and actually were able to use our sort of molded barley to accelerate the fermentation process from a process that probably would have taken a year to two years to 10 weeks. It also rounds it out, gives it a bigger depth of flavor. Um, but yeah, you guys just had grasshoppers. <laughs> So, uh, so we, um, we, this is Ariel Johnson, our, our flavor chemist, who was in fact working on, uh, she was in fact working on vinegars, uh, doing a, she's doing a PhD in uh, flavor chemistry at UC Davis, uh, she has sensory science, yeah, well, I'm not sure what the title is, definitely, she knows a lot about chemistry and everything, and what she did was that she started looking into these different things, as we started looking on other insects, tasting them, we started uh, tasting ants, just running around the forest, tasting different ants and eating all these things. And, and all of a sudden, we could find, like, you know, lemongrass, just as Alex would tell we'd find, like, citrusy flavors, even one that tastes like coriander. And, and in a cuisine where these flavors are not usually available to you, all of a sudden, we could use citrus plants, because vinegars are what usually brings in the citrusy flavors in Nordic cuisine. Um, what Ariel did then was to, to look at these molecules. Uh, Actually, that I, was, I was looking at the different ways of... Uh, that ants use um, pheromones oh, yeah, yeah, to communicate. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's why it's really nice having a flavor scientist on your lab, because she was just sort of walking by and goes, oh, that's the volatile chemical for lemongrass. I said, OK, well, what's this one? She goes, mint, coriander. And all these different things like camp, camp here. <laughs> and this is her sort of drawing out the, the rest of the molecules for us. But, so, um, so it turns out the taste of lemongrass in an ant is not just that it's somehow a little bit lemongrassy, it's actually the same flavor compound that is apparent in lemongrass and in the ant. Part of it, yeah. The, for, the, the species of ants is called formic ants, um, and they use this formic acid as a defense mechanism. And when we initially started this uh, insect project, we thought there was not a single evidence, not a single use of insects in the Nordic cuisine. When you start asking, everyone that you possibly know about it. And we, oh, we hear stories from like woodsmen that, yeah, their father used to actually open up ant hills and take a piece of bread and hold it near these formic ants and they would actually spray out this acid that they would l flavor their bread with lemon. So when we start um, I mean, even looking of, into of it. bee larvae, for instance, with the, with the bit, turning up, turns out the bee larvae that comes out straight out of the bee comb that you take out to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, get mites out because they get attacked by mites in these organic bees. Uh, they taste like, taste like hazelnuts. They are like 42 degrees hot when they get out. They're absolutely delicious and melts on the tongue. Very buttery, very fatty. We use it instead of eggs and mayonnaise at the moment. Um, and, but, these, but these beekeepers have been eating them you know, for centuries because they knew they were good to eat and they would just sit there and sip them up. When you look at the, the, the UN reports on, on insects as food, it's, it's described as like a superfood, like the virtual superfood of the future, these things, because no one eats them. But, I mean, and our opinion is that if, no, if we don't make, uh, find a way to make it delicious, people aren't going to eat them. Mm. Um, and also, for just in terms of having a sustainable food source, we think it's really important to integrate this into Western hot cuisine. Because we find in the reports from talking with sort of anthropologists that there's a lot of developing countries that consume insects, but are sort of, it's thought of as... Yeah, it's, 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 it's one of those things where where rising uh, wealth gives way to Western modes of civilization, and that means that, that these tr traditional uses of insects, even though they, they, they uh, don't have to use them because of sustenance, um, or subsist as for subsistence reasons, um, it slowly gets muted because they feel a bit ashamed of eating these things that are um, you know, uh, considered inedible and disgusting. Uh, so we thought, you know, why don't we, you know, in, in, this, you know, in, in high cuisine, go in and, and re-implement this idea of eating insects, because then we can influence the Western markets, influence the Western consumers, and open their eyes to say that insects can, in fact, be good, and find out which ones are good, and, 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 and try and, and create a triple, trickle-down effect like you would do with, a, with like a, a, a space shuttle, in a sense, that ends up in a microwave, or however that story goes. As a microwave in the kitchen, that's, that's what we're going to try and do, is delicious, uh, develop some of these delicious things, and hopefully it will get picked up because people like them, not because they have to eat them.
This is a list of the samples we, uh, we, we gave you at the talk. And we hope, of course, you liked it. We know everyone doesn't necessarily like all these things, but, it's, uh, but we hope you enjoyed them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much.